I've taught on this before when we went through John. And by the way, if you have not gone through my playlist for the book of John, uh, <laughs> I dare you to do it. It is a really good edifying. If you're like going, man, I, there's no food out there. Oh my goodness. Please go through John with me. Uh, just go to my playlist, look for John and get started. It will bless you. I know it's a word for now. I gave it last year, but I felt it was prophetic. Um, but uh, in the book of John, there are three t pictures of the death of Christ. Two are negative and one is positive. The lamb slain for the, uh, slam, the lamb who takes away the sins of the world, right? The lamb of God. The bronze serpent who became sin and condemned sin in his flesh. It's not just that he removed the sin from us as far as judgment is concerned. He actually swallowed it up in his death. And so that's why his death is so powerful and why we focus on our death with him because it is his death and its effectiveness applied to us by the Spirit that is the answer to sin. That's why Romans says, uh, Romans 8 says, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And uh, Galatians says, if you walk according to the flesh, you'll not fulfill our spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why? Because the killing power of the cross in his condemnation of sin is uh, in the spirit as a present reality. So the spirit is everything in the Christian life because the spirit is the realization of the uh, Christ in his incarnation, his humanity, his human virtues, his perfect uplifted humanity that expresses God in righteousness and his death with, it, with its effectiveness to deal with the penalty of sin and with its power um, and his resurrection and his ascension with its authority is all accumulated in, into the spirit to become the life-giving spirit so that now the spirit we've received is all of that. So when we walk according to the spirit, that's how we put to death the deeds of the body. We don't live by carnal rules, commandments, and ordinances. We live by being filled with the Spirit. And that kind of brings you to the third picture in John 12, where he says, Yes, indeed, it is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And that is a positive picture of his death and resurrection without reference to sin related to multiplication multiplication of the life in the seed in his death his humanity as the shell is broken open and the life within through resurrection is released and multiplied as a harvest and that is the reality of the kingdom the kingdom is not just Jesus ruling in an outward way. That's not ultimately what he wants, although he will have that aspect because he has the throne of David. And he'll rule over the nations who are not born of his life uh, during the millennium and give them a chance to be saved, you know. But for us, we are the result of his resurrection. We are his multiplication. We are his increase. We are his harvest. The single grain of wheat fell into the ground and died and then there was a multiplication his and his life was released and it comes to us as the seed which is the word of life and our heart is the soil and when that heart receives that word the life gets planted in and so we are regenerated of his life we're born of his life that's what it means to be born again is that this person who became a man, lived a human life, a perfect human life without sin, died on the cross, dealt with the penalty of sin and with its power, also opened up his very being, and then in resurrection springs up not just as the only begotten son, but as the firstborn among many brethren who are to be conformed to his image and glorified, the firstborn from among the dead the firstborn and the head of a new creation, which is the new man, which is a single entity called the body of Christ, the church, 
which are all members of the same organism having the same life. Christ the head and us as many members. And what we're to learn is how to live by this life. And the devil did not want that to happen. The devil tempted Jesus and said, All the kingdoms of this world and its glory have been given to me to give to whoever I will. All you have to do is bow to me and I'll give them to you. And he could have circumvented the cross. And he could have just ruled outwardly as a king. Okay, He could have just issued royal decrees and everybody would have to obey. And if they didn't, they could be thrown in the lake of fire. That's not what he wanted. That's not God's intention. God's intention is that the son, as the shepherd, would come and give his life to the sheep. And that the sheep would become sons of God. Uh, they would be gathered home by his life into glory. So we've received the spirit who is the reality of everything that Christ is and has accomplished. And he dwells in our spirit to be enjoyed. He's a fountain of living water. And the fact that we're regenerated of that life is satisfying to God. It is the will of the Father. It is the accomplishment of the Son. We are his inheritance. We are God's inheritance. Of course, he delights in us. And he delights in Christ in us. And this is the vision, again, of the Christian life. The Christian life is a life of living Christ. Uh, the Christian life is not I, but Christ. The Christian life is for me to live as Christ. Why? Because he gave his life. Positively, this is not just related to sin. Again, most people have a view of salvation that is all just about sin. Why? Because they're sin conscious. Where'd they get that? From the fall. Who told you you were naked, right? Sh they're naked and ashamed. Uh, but God intervened immediately to cover their nakedness by slaying an animal. And that was the first type, the lamb slain, right? To remove their sins and to cover them before God. And we need to stand in our covering. When we approach God, we need to stand in what he's provided, which is Christ is our righteousness. He's the lamb. He's taken away our sin. We need to believe that. And we need to come forward by faith in him uh, to be nourished by him as life. And, and the nourishment has nothing to do with sin. And back to the prodigal son, you know, there's no reference. God did not chide the prodigal son all the way home saying, look what you did. You squandered everything. You were down in the pig's lot. See, I told you, you better not do that again. There was no sin consciousness. He threw his arms around him, put the robe on his shoulders, put the ring on his finger, and brought him into a feast that was, must have been so wonderful because it made his brother jealous. God puts you in a situation that makes religious people jealous, and you didn't do anything. And that's because God loved you from the foundation of the world and sent the shepherd to come and give his life for you, not because you sinned, but because he wants you to be in his family. See, we need to have a view that there's a positive view, a, a positive aspect of the salvation that has nothing to do with sin and is entirely related to life. And this is the mystery that's hidden from the natural man. Uh, this is the wisdom we speak among the mature, mature, even the hidden wisdom, predestined for our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For if they'd have known it, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. If Satan knew that by putting to death the only begotten son, he was going to make him the firstborn of many brethren, conformed to his image and glorified and sharing in his inheritance and his life, he wouldn't have done it. And there was, a, there was a mystery in God's heart that there's a group of people that he knew and loved that he chose in Christ to be holy and without blemish before him in love and predestinated unto sonship and predestined to be co-heirs with Christ, to reign with him forever. That's the church. This is the eternal purpose of God. And it's through the church that God's putting his multifarious wisdom on display to the angels. It's to the, through the church that God himself is fully expressed because it's the habitation of God in spirit. And it's the through the church that Christ is being put on display because the church is his body, which is his fullness. 
the fullness of him who fills all in all. It is his multiplication. It is his increase. It is the firstborn and the many sons coming back to the Father as an inheritance. Like he says in Hebrews, Behold, I and the children that you've given to me. We are his glory. We are his increase. We are his multiplication. And we can stand boldly and see what the devil wants you to do is have sin consciousness instead. He, he doesn't care if you know Jesus as the lamb as long as he can remind you of your sins. You know, the Old Testament saints, they offered up lambs constantly. And Hebrews says that as long as they did, there was just a reminder of sins and their conscience wasn't perfected. Satan isn't scared of you knowing that Jesus is the lamb as much as he is of you knowing that he's your life. <laughs> So he wants you to be sin consciousness, so full of sin consciousness, fear and condemnation, so that you'll shrink back into the outer court and never come into the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is where the throne of God is, where Christ is seated, waiting for his enemies to be subject and put as a footstool under his feet. And he has all authority. And he gives you strength there. And he ministers himself as bread and wine. He's the Melchizedek. He's your high priest there. And if you don't know how to avail yourself confidently of him, then you are impotent and weak. You're still an heir, but you're starving. You're not in the feasting house. The feasting house is in the Holy of Holies, which we have access to by faith. But we need to see that we are heirs of a great salvation that is not just about sin, but even more about subjecting the world to come. And the reason Satan hates it is because we'll rule angels will judge angels. We've been seated in Christ far above all principality and power, every name that is named, both in this world and the world to come. We've replaced and usurped. There's no room for him because of us. So we need to crowd in to the holy of all, holiest of all. We need to crowd into the presence of God and come boldly as the sons of God, recognizing who we are in God's heart. Your sins are just for a moment. This life is a vapor. But with everlasting love, he's loved you, right? His love towards you, his, the, his, uh, his thoughts are to, towards you are more than the sands of the seashore, individually, because you're a son of God. And he knows you in Christ from before the foundation of the world and chose you. Don't be scared of that. It's true. If you believe in Jesus, you can know for sure that God knew you and sent his son to come get you. He sent his son to die for the sins of the whole world. But Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And that is an intimate knowledge. Again, uh, he raised us up and seated us with him that the ages to come he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. And God being the I am outside of time, all the works were finished from the foundation of the world. He's already spent those ages to come with us. So he does know you intimately. He has a history with you that you haven't experienced yet as a son of God. And in that feasting house with him forever, there's never going to be a remembrance of sin again. So there's no reason for you to be bogged down reminding yourself of sin every day. The way, though, to get out of that spirit of bondage and fear and slavery is by the spirit of sonship, which cries, Abba, Father. Right? We've not been given a spirit of... Those who are led of the spirit of God, they are the children of God. For you've not given, been given a spirit of bondage to bring you back into fear. But a spirit of sonship in which we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And we've been predestinated to be glorified with him. And we have a secure hope of glory. And we rejoice and even boast in the hope of the glory of God. Confidently, not shrinking back in shame. Abide in him so that when he appears, you may have confidence at his coming and not shrink back in shame. Why would you shrink back in shame? Because you're full of sin consciousness. You only see Christ as the lamb. But you need to see that you have his life. And that God's uh, intention towards you is not just about sin. It's much more about his kindness in the ages to come. That's why he came and got you. 
He didn't send Jesus to die for you because you're a sinner. He sent Jesus to die for you so that you might be his son. He didn't love you because of your sins. He loved you because you're his son. <laughs> he loves you because he's a father. We need to get our view right. We can't, we, can't, we can't have confidence if we're bogged down in this sin consciousness. Okay, the dogs are barking. I gotta get going. I just wanted to speak a little while I have the unction.